As we continue to examine the idea that Mark copied from Homer, let's consider Mark the author. Was it important for Mark that his readers got his Homeric parallels? It seems so. Mark seems to have provided a few fairly obvious flags for his readers to let them know to look for Homeric parallels. One of these flags can be found just before the anointing scene we covered in the last video. Jesus speaks about his own second coming in language that is suspiciously similar to the Odyssey's main plot. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. This is exactly what happens in the Odyssey. Odysseus leaves his home on a journey, fights in the Trojan War, and spends another 16 years just trying to get back home. He leaves his servants in charge and eventually does come home disguised as a beggar, only to find treachery with the suitors vying for Penelope's hand in marriage, since they all think he's died on his journey. And some of Odysseus' servants had switched sides and become traitors and betrayers, thinking that he was never going to return. This is exactly parallel to the warning in Mark's parable. Be on the alert. The master could return home at any time. Be faithful. Keep watching. It seems that another of Mark's goals was to create a text that carried multiple parallels. This parable by Jesus also contains parallels to the betrayal by Peter and the sleeping servants we find in the Garden of Gethsemane. The rooster crowing is not only a parallel, but a foreshadowing of Peter's denial. Foreshadowing is a literary technique to clue the reader in to watch for this or that later on in the story. It is not how someone would record history. The reference to sleeping is also a foreshadowing of the sleeping disciples while Jesus prays in the garden. Sleeping when they should have been keeping watch. The parable's more direct application also applies as Mark, through the mouth of Jesus, was warning Christians of his day to stay faithful until Jesus appeared on earth to judge everyone. It seems that the more parallels you could cram into one scene, the better. In the story of the Odyssey, the suitors are literally devouring Odysseus's house, or we could say Penelope's house, since she had lived there for 16 years without a husband and whom the suitors believed to be a widow. They were pillaging her goods and vying for the best spots at the banquets when they should have been acting civilized. Mark gives his readers yet another Homeric flag to alert them that his story is taking a clue from the greatest story of his day. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses. Is this just another coincidence or another flag Mark has given his readers? Surely Mark was casting the Jewish religious leaders into the role of the suitors for Penelope and the foil for Odysseus. Every hero needs his nemesis and Mark is deliberately giving his readers hints that they should view the scribes in the same light as the treacherous suitors in the Odyssey. Speaking of banquets, did you ever notice in Mark's feeding of the 5,000 that there were no women and children present? I didn't either. It's easy to overlook. Here's the verse in question. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Why is this a problem? The Greek used here is the Greek word for the male gender, aneir, which is used to distinguish a man from a woman and is not the same as anthropos, which means man in the sense of human being. We see Mark using anthropos 
just 30 verses prior to the feeding miracle. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Should we believe that Mark meant that only men should repent? No, of course not. The word in verse 12 is anthropos, which means mankind or human beings. If Mark had intended the feeding miracle to include men and women and children, he would have just left off the word aner altogether. That Mark intended to mean only men were at the feeding miracle is certainly corroborated by Matthew, who interpreted the verse in precisely this way and found it highly improbable that huge crowds of only men would be present if people from all the surrounding areas had come to see Jesus. So he promptly edited Mark's account to explicitly include women and children as well. And they that did eat were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So there can be no debate about what is being said here. 5,000 men and men only. And further, assuming the crowd did have women and children, it would make no sense for Mark to refer to the crowd as a whole as aner, which always denotes male gender. Matthew knew that this made little sense, so he clarified it in his version. Further, a huge crowd of men only seems a bit contrived given that women were also following Jesus around in other scenes. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. But the real oddity is that if we read a few verses before this one, you'd have to assume that men, women, and children rushed out of the cities and gathered around Jesus to hear him preach. The people saw them going and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Are we to assume that only men ran from all the cities waiting to hear and see Jesus? Would Mark not be able to simply say, those that ate were 5,000, period, without adding that they were all men. Clearly, Mark meant what he wrote. So how can we account for the magical transformation from a normal crowd of people to men only? Again, knowing Mark's source or sources is key to understanding why his tale seems so conflicting. Mark surely based the feeding of the 5,000 in part upon a scene from the Old Testament, as well as the Odyssey, and this has introduced the problem of men only. In the Old Testament, Elisha feeds 100 men and men only, which by itself would explain why Mark chose to feed men only. But is there something in the Odyssey from which Mark could have also drawn that would not only explain the men only part, but the quantity of men fed? Rather than paraphrase it, I'll read Dennis R. MacDonald's explanation from page 86 of his book, The Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark, from which all of my Homer Mark info has been derived. When Telemachus and Athena arrived at Pylos, they witnessed a feast to Poseidon on the shore, at which the celebrants sat divided into nine units, and 500 men were in each, 4,500. Later, the poet makes it clear that at this feast, only the men of Pylos participated. The male-only party in Homer presumably is due to the nature of the feast, a sacrifice by sailors to secure favorable weather and seas from Poseidon. The 5,000 whom Jesus served at the shore of the Sea of Galilee likewise were exclusively male. Mark gives no justification for the presence only of men. Matthew added women and children. The correlations of disembarkations at shores and the feedings of 4,500 or 5,000 men are not accidental. They are Markan flags. Homer's second feast at Menelaus' Sparta was lavish but presumably smaller, and because it was a wedding feast, it included women. Similarly, the crowd in Mark's second meal, though substantial, is smaller than at the first, and it, like the Spartan wedding, seems to have included women.
Well, that wraps up this video. I had planned on touching on the parallels between Odysseus' crew members and Jesus' crew members, but instead I'll leave that one for you to do as homework and call this video done. I've got two more parallels I want to show you before we wrap up this entire section on Mark copying from Homer and Greek mythology. If you don't watch any other video in this section, you must watch the next one. It's going to hit you like a bolt of lightning. See you there.